Last October 17th, we had the privilege to be invited to the Congress of the Royal Club of Romanian Doctors to talk about the importance of OCT and OCTA. My personal talk was on tomographic evaluation of macular changes in pathologic myopia. Because we need a few tips to accurate perform a tomographic evaluation in patients with high myopia. These are my financial disclosures, none of them uh, absolutely relevant to the topic that it is going to be covered in the present talk. And uh, I would like to reinforce the idea that the current presentation does not include my personal observations or original work. The concept is that when we face a fundus like this, it's very likely that we will not agree in how we call each one of the signs that we can see here, or here, or here. High myopia is a very complicated disease with a myriad of signs in the fundus examination and the OCT uh, examination. There is a wide spectrum of pathologic features that we can summarize in choroidal neovascularization, vitreo retinal traction, and choroidal atrophy, but we may not forget that all these changes can take place in the same case of one particular patient. So in order to perfectly well classify what we are seeing, the group led by Jose Maria Ruiz Moreno recently published this wonderful review with a proposal for a new classification and, gra and grading system in my myopic maculopathy. First, we have the atrophic component of, of the myopic maculopathy, beginning, beginning with no evidence of retinal lesions and followed by the presence of tessellated fundus, which is the most frequent atrophic change that we can find in patients with myopia. Eventually, these patients can develop diffuse chororetinal atrophy, which is consistent, consistent with the presence of these yellowish-orange uh, lesions that we can find, particularly around the optic nerve or more widespread in the evolution of one particular patient. But this whitish or orangish appearance of the fundus is typical for diffuse chororetinal atrophy, A2 stage of atrophic myopic maculopathy. Here we can see another two examples, another one, same thing, yellowish appearance of the fundus in a focal area. That's diffuse chororetinal atrophy. This is more easy to identify the presence of patchy chororetinal atrophy that usually develops following the arcades or within the posterior pole involving the macular region. The patchy chororetinal atrophy is consistent with these really white uh, well delineated lesions. When a patient develops complete macular atrophy, complete patchy chororetinal atrophy, without the evidence of neovascularization associated with that, we call that complete macular atrophy stage A4 of atrophic myopic maculopathy. Second, we have the tractional component of the myopic maculopathy, T0 when there is no schisis, T1 when we find inner, like the case shown here, inner phobiskisis, another example of inner phobiskisis, and we may also find only outer phobiskisis, involving the outer retinal layers, particularly outer nuclear layers. They may also be coincident, and then we talk about T2 stage, inner and outer phobiskisis, like the case 
zoom here, we, we can see a volume of a vessel inner phobiskisis and also phobiskisis involving the inner retina. Another example, and this beautiful image provided by Dr. Juan Manuel Cubero from uh, Cordoba, Spain, where we can see beautifully illustrated the outer phobiskisis and the inner phobiskisis in one only case. Eventually, these cases may develop foveal detachment, that, like the image shown here. And also, full thickness macular holes, with a particular situation in myopic patients where this macular hole may behave as the regmatogenous lesion, leading to a retinal detachment, which is T5 stage of tractional myopic maculopathy. And finally, we have the neovascular component of myopic maculopathy. First, with the presence of lacquer cracks. We should not forget that macular lacquer cracks are precursors of the development of choroidal neovascularization, and these patients may be followed up, follow up very closely. Here we can see a subretinal spontaneous hemorrhage in a highly myopic patient. In the video tomography, we see that the RP is intact. Remember that macular lacquer cracks develop in many cases following a spontaneous subretinal hemorrhage. Stage N2A is for active choroidal neovascularization, which can be easily identified in the fundus examination, but OCT plays a key role in the detection of such lesions. Myopic patients develop type 2 neovascular lesions, which grow on top of the RPE, which is eroded, and through that ero erosion, the fibrovascular lesion grows within the subretinal space. Here we can see the disruption of the RPE and the fibrovascular lesion growing within the subretinal space, type 2, macular neovascularization. Another similar case, where we can see the erosion of the RPE and the fibrovascular lesion causing leakage in the paraphobial area. Also, we can monitor the response to anti-BGF treatment very nicely showing what used to be activity and where is no more exudation. Another similar case, a subtil exudative activity of this neovascular lesion and the beautiful response to anti-VGF therapies. And finally, the very well-known Forster's Fuchs spot which consists on macular atrophy growing around a fibrovascular lesion which evolved into a scar. So we see a disiform scar in myopic patients with atrophy surrounding that lesion. In the OCTs, we can perfectly see the disruption of the RPE and the presence of subretinal fibrosis. Another case with autoretinal tubulation associated. So in summary, in patients with high myopia, we can find atrophy, traction, and neovascularization, and thanks to the elegant work published by Ruiz Moreno, we can all classify exactly the same cases that we see in our routine clinical practice in a very easy way. Atrophic component A, tractional component T, neovascular component M, with each one of the stages that we have previously described. And beyond this, remember that high myopic patients may present 
peripapillary choroidal cavitations. Dom sheet macula. Ansophobal detachment associated with inferior staphyloma or even dom shaped macula. So there is a huge myriad of signs that we need to identify in order to provide an accurate prognosis and treatment for myopic patients. Not to mention the need to differentiate in young myopic patients between multifocal choroiditis and the patchy atrophy as described for myopic changes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again to the Royal Club of Romanian Doctors and Dr. Catalina Dumitrescu for the kind invitation. And uh, please feel free to comment Whatever you wish, we will try to get back to you through our YouTube, Twitter, Instagram or Facebook channel.